we get started? Perfect. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today at Hatfield's Research Seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt, and I'm the Research Program Manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, located in Newport, Oregon, and I will be your host for today. We do have your cameras, mics, and screen shares disabled for this particular event, um, and but we do hope that you ask any questions in the chat box um, and we'll work through those at the end but feel free to put them in at any time so you don't forget them um, but yeah use the chat box and we can interact with today's speaker in that way i also wanted to let everybody know that we will be recording today's we are recording today's event um, and i will put in the um, chat box here in a little bit um, the link for that. And so if you're looking to watch this again or to share it with others, feel free to share that link. Um, I thought I had it already programmed and ready to go, but I don't. So I'll do it when I stop talking. So forgive me about that. Um, wanted to just promo next week's uh, seminar. We have a really interesting speaker coming. Um, so next week is March 10th. We have Yvonne Arsimed, um, who is an associate professor with the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation Sciences at Oregon State University. And he's gonna be talking to us about understanding scientific collaboration under the lens of diversity and inclusion. So I'm hoping that folks can come and join us and be a part of that conversation, which is a really important one for us to have here at Hatfield. Um, but if you would like information about that event or any of our upcoming events, if you go to HMSC's homepage, scroll to the bottom, there's a calendar of events there with all the login information that you might need. Also, I'm going to put in my own selfish plug. Uh, we have one more opening in our seminar series that just opened up um, due to a change in someone's schedule on April 14th. So if anybody is interested in giving a seminar, um, Emily has done this. She saw we had an opening and stepped in and helped me out. So if somebody wants to uh, take inspiration from Emily, today's speaker, uh, feel free to let me know that we have an opening on April 14th and you can uh, give a presentation. But for today, um, just to tell you a little bit more about today's speaker. Uh, oh, Emily, I'm going to do it. So say your last name for me. Schlesinger. <laughs> Schlesinger. Emily Schlesinger is, uh, received her PhD in oceanography at Rutgers University in the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences um, in December of 2021. She started her current position as a postdoctoral fellow with NOAA's Alaska Fishery Science Center here at Hatfield, um, January 2022. Her research focus uh, focuses on the impacts of climate change on important fisheries species, ranging from individual effects to population-wide changes in energetics and reproduction. Her ultimate goal is to provide research that assists fisheries management decisions that promote sustainable fishing under changing climate. And Emily has told me that she's a firm believer in hard scientific work requires life work balance when you can find it. And so when she's not in the lab, in the field or behind her computer, you can find Emily trail running, biking, swimming, hiking and fishing and finding all sorts of new ways to enjoy the outdoors. So Emily, we're so excited to have you here and to be a part of the Hatfield family. Um, the floor is yours. Go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Simon, for the introduction. Um, so yeah, my name is Emily Schlesinger. I'm an NRC research associate working through the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And I'm going to share with you all some of the work that I did during my PhD at Rutgers, um, as well as my proposed postdoctoral work while I'm out here at Hatfield. So I likely don't need to convince this crowd that climate change is real, but I think it's important to check in and really acknowledge some of these recent severe adverse effects of climate change that maybe we feel um, as, as humans living on land. So one of those is um, these really warm summers that we've been having. And last summer was one of the hottest summers on record for many locations. Um, across the U.S., especially here in the Pacific Northwest. And if any of you were around for last summer, I'm sure you can attest to some of that record-breaking temperature. Alternatively, we're also seeing a decrease in the amount of days that it is really cold in the winter. And this has implications for pest management, for um, ecosystem functioning in terms of um, certain plants or animals that actually required time to be spent at really cold temperatures. 
Um, and so this can have um, whole level ecosystem impacts. Now that's it for my terrestrial talk um, because all of my work is focused in the ocean um, and I'm focused on two main climate change stressors. The first of which is ocean warming. And so essentially all of this excess heat in our atmosphere, about 93% of it is being absorbed by the ocean. Um, and so we can kind of see this increase in energy or ocean heat content over time. Um, now this is the kind of baseline trend that we've been seeing, but across different regional um, seas and oceans, there may be accelerated warming due to changes in currents, um, wind dynamics and so forth. And I'm also interested in ocean acidification, essentially um, a similar idea as with warming, but this excess carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, a good portion of it is also being absorbed by the ocean. And through the dissociation of carbon dioxide in seawater, we start to get an excess in hydrogen protons, which subsequently decreases the pH. And so we've seen this trend of decreasing pH throughout time um, and may expect to see a pretty low pH into the future. Now, a lot of my research is focused on the effects of these climate change stressors on important fishery species. Um, the idea being here is that if we can understand how these species will be impacted by current and future climate change, we may be able to be proactive in some of our fisheries management. And I'm gonna walk through some brief overviews of some of the big um, uh, effects that we tend to see in terms of ocean warming and ocean acidification, starting with ocean warming first. And so the big idea here is that ocean, um, if we look at a graph of ocean temperature and body temperature, and we look at an endotherm, so say a dolphin, um, we can see that as ocean temperature increases, their body temperature will remain constant. Compare that to an ectotherm, so a fish, as ocean temperature increases, their body temperature also increases. And here under ocean warming, as our oceans are warming, these species will simultaneously experience warming within their body systems, and that can lead to a whole suite of physiological effects. Um, one of the most severe effects that we can see is a decrease in survival rate or an increase in mortality. So this is an experimental study looking at the effects of ocean warming on coral reef fish at three different warming scenarios. And I just wanna draw your attention to this solid black line. Um, this was the warmest scenario in their experiment. And under this one, they found a decrease in survival about 50% at that warm scenario. Now, the decrease in survival is the most severe effect. Um, and another effect that we tend to see that may not necessarily be lethal is an increase in the metabolic rates of these fish as their body systems warm. And this is looking at a couple of different types of metabolic rates that we can look at. Um, and generally, what I want you to take away from here is a majority of them will increase um, under increasing temperature. A lot of the ideas here in this graph, though, I'm going to get into a bit more later on. And finally, if we compare across different life stages of fish, we can see that there are certain life stages that are more sensitive than others. So this was a meta-analysis looking at the temperature optimal range for different life stages of many fish um, throughout the world. And they found that spawning fish and embryos were the most sensitive to ocean warming. And this is concerning because these are the life stages that we typically focus on um, in terms of fisheries management and trying to see if a population is able to replenish itself year after year under both natural and fishing mortality. Now, all of those effects are assuming that fish are remaining put in these warming regions. And so another dominant response that we've been seeing are distribution shifts. And the two main responses um, that we've been seeing are either a, um, shift with latitude and moving further poleward or at a higher latitude, or a shift with depth and going deeper into the water column. And the idea here being that species are quote unquote seeking optimal temperatures. And so we're seeing that um, through their distribution shifts. All right, so moving on to ocean acidification. Now um, I'm gonna put a disclaimer out there that the effects of ocean acidification are a lot more nuanced. 
than they are for ocean warming. Um, and so I'm not gonna give a very, um, this is a very brief overview of some of the effects of ocean acidification. So imagine we have a fish and this fish breathes in seawater as that water um, passes um, by the gill membranes. And if that seawater has um, a lower pH, that means that these fish are breathing in an excess of hydrogen ions. And this can subsequently lead to a reduction in blood pH, as well as potentially a reduction in carbonate um, ions. But it's important to note that fish have the capacity to buffer their bloodstream and their um, internal fluids. And so um, what we'll see is an increase in bicarbonate in the fish bloodstream as a way to kind of combat these pH changes. But that can lead to some effects, um, one of which can be sensory impairments. Um, so one of the big things that we've been seeing is that under ocean acidification, the otoliths or the ear bones in fish increase in size, and that could be due to that excess of bicarbonate. Um, and that can subsequently lead to potential sensory impairments. Um, there are also behavioral impairments that can happen due to um, changes with neurotransmitters. Um, it's important to note that this buffering um, is not free. And so sometimes fish can also experience an increase in energy demand. And also due to some of these changes in pH, we can see a change in metabolism. Um, it's important to remember that a lot of processes in the body, um, in fish and in us, are um, kind of dictated by offsets in pH. And so when you change the pH in a fish, a whole lot of things can happen. And then ultimately, um, sometimes what we can end up seeing too is reduced growth and reduced reproduction. And now all of these um, that I have listed here, I want you to put an asterisk on. And that's because we tend to see very species specific responses where some fish are showing these negative um, effects and others are completely unaffected by ocean warming. And so there's a lot more research to be done here. But similar to ocean warming, we do tend to see some differences at um, different life stages of fish, where these earlier life stages tend to be more sensitive to ocean acidification than these later life stages. And the idea here is that the older the fish, the better their buffering capacity. Um, but again, um, a lot of the studies that are showing this tend to be very species um, specific. All right, so I'm gonna take us on a um, little trip and we are going to first go to the US Northeast Shelf to investigate ocean warming. Um, and then afterwards, we're gonna go over to the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska to investigate both ocean warming and ocean acidification. And so we're gonna start with the US Northeast Shelf. Um, this is where I did my PhD at Rutgers. And I'm gonna go over um, some of my PhD results. So the US Northeast Shelf is one of the most rapidly warming regions in the world. And a lot of this has to do with um, just the net increase in ocean heat content, but also changes in current dynamics, um, where essentially the Gulf Stream is becoming stronger and the Labrador current is becoming weaker um, and they kind of combat each other. And so under that weakening, um, we tend to see a higher intrusion of Gulf stream water on the shelf and that can lead to this really fast um, warming. The US Northeast Shelf extends across the almost half of the United States East Coast. Um, and so there's a lot of states that are affected um, by this ocean warming. And it's an incredibly important region for commercial and recreational fisheries, as it offers lots of habitat, both inshore and offshore, as well as many very large estuaries and river systems. And for my dissertation, I primarily focused on black sea bass, which you can see here, um, not to be confused with giant black sea bass or giant sea bass that you can find out on the West Coast. Um, but Black sea bass are a demersal species, so they like to hang out on the bottom. And they have this, inch, they have this migration dynamic where they'll migrate inshore um, throughout their distribution. So from Cape Hatteras all the way up to the Gulf of Maine, and those inshore waters um, during the summer to spawn. And then they'll migrate back down offshore near the continental shelf break in that southeastern portion for overwintering. <laughs> 
And Black sea bass have kind of become this poster child of this northward shift in a center of biomass or a distribution shift. Um, and I pulled out two representative years kind of illustrating what we've been seeing over time, where in the past, most of black sea bass were being found off of Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware, but say in 2018, um, a majority of black sea bass were found off the coast of New Jersey and northward up into Massachusetts. And so altogether, um, my um, focal research questions first looked at the effects of ocean warming at that individual level, so looking at um, individual physiology and then broadening to the population level and looking at the indirect effect of ocean warming, which is that distribution shift and trying to understand that in the context of potential interspecific differences in black sea bass um, throughout that distribution. And so we're gonna start off with the first question um, and looking at um, how ocean warming is impacting black sea bass. Um, this paper, you can find it in PLOS One, and I just want to thank and acknowledge all of my co-authors um, on this paper. So if you want to understand the effects of ocean warming, it's useful to try to determine a thermal optimum for them. And we did this by measuring aerobic scope, and I'm going to walk through that concept um, right now. So imagine that we have increasing temperature and we're looking at metabolic rate. The first metabolic rate we can measure is called standard metabolic rate, and this is the baseline maintenance level of metabolism required to keep an organism alive. And this metabolic rate tends to increase with increasing temperature. We can also measure a maximum metabolic rate, which is the highest the metabolic rate can go aerobically, so with oxygen. And this will typically increase with temperature, but at some point they're unable to meet their energy demands and we'll actually start to see a decrease in the maximum metabolic rate. And the difference between these two rates is known as the absolute aerobic scope or free aerobic scope. And the idea here is that this aerobic scope is available metabolism to an organism that they can put towards things like swimming, feeding, evading predators, reproduction, et cetera but essentially all these activities that can increase the fitness of an organism. And so theory will state that wherever aerobic scope is maximized, the temperature that it tracks to should be the thermal optimum. I also wanna point out that when we measure fish metabolic rates, what we're really measuring is a rate of oxygen consumption. So how much oxygen they're removing from the water over a set amount of time. And this is a proxy for a metabolic rate. So we can measure these metabolic rates in the lab. Um, we first put black sea bass in a respirometer seen here to measure their standard metabolic rate over about 23 hours. This is an air and water tight chamber where we can measure that rate of oxygen consumption. Afterwards, we could place, we place black sea bass in a swim flume seen here. This is kind of like a fish treadmill. And so from this, we can swim a fish and elicit that maximum metabolic rate response. And then afterwards, we can calculate their aerobic scope. We did this um, across a temperature range of 12 to 30 degrees Celsius. This includes both currently experienced and future temperatures for black sea bass. We also held a subset of black sea bass at 30 degrees for an entire month to test acclimation potential. And those fish will be known as the 30 chronic group. We also measured hypoxia tolerance or PCRIT at all of those experimental temperatures. I'm not gonna get into those methods or results right now, but I'm happy to go over them later. All right, so first we're gonna look at the two different metabolic rates, maximum and standard. Um, and so here we're looking again at a graph of increasing temperature and that metabolic rate. Um, I first wanna draw your eyes to those open circles, which is standard metabolic rate. We see that this increase with temperature as we expect, um, and there was no significant difference between that 30, 30 degree chronic and 30 degree regular group. In the closed circles, we have maximum metabolic rate, and we see this also increases with um, increasing temperature, but at some point we actually start to see a decrease in that maximum metabolic rate and a significant decrease in that 30 degree chronic group compared to the regular 30 degree group. And so altogether, we can get the aerobic scope from those metabolic rates 
fit a curve to the data and determine a thermal optimum from it, which we found to be about 24 degrees Celsius. Um, we also, again, see this significant drop in that aerobic scope for the 30 degree chronic group. And I also want to point out that it is a lower aerobic scope than even fish seen at 12 degrees Celsius. And so theory will state that 24 degrees Celsius should be the thermal optimum for black sea bass, but it was actually fairly warm temperature. And it wouldn't be the first time that a study has found sort of this warm shifted thermal optimum, which I'm happy to talk about kind of what that means later. Um, but we went further and suggested that 24 is likely a maximum tolerable temperature. And I'm gonna go over some of that reasoning. First, um, it's useful to look at our laboratory derived thermal optimum curve to those that can be generated from field-based studies. Um, I want you to specifically look at the yellow line. This is a fishery observer um, data set, so a fisheries dependent um, survey. And then the pink is the Northeast Fishery Science Center bottom trawl survey. And their um, thermal optima uh, agrees at about 17 degrees Celsius, which is about seven degrees colder than the thermal optimum that we found. So already there's a little bit of disagreement between what we see in the field and what we got in the lab. We also saw no acclimation to 30 degrees Celsius at that warm temperature treatment. Um, and not only did we see no acclimation, but these fish did pretty poorly. They had a really a low aerobic scope, um, and it was actually the only treatment that we saw mortality um, throughout, throughout our experiments. And also we can look at a metric known as metabolic index. Um, so this is essentially um, another metric that we can get using hypoxia tolerance. Um, and this metric tends to decrease with increasing temperature. Um, and there, um, it tells us more of a limiting temperature instead of an optimal temperature. Um, and so typically a metabolic index of three is the limiting value for most populations. Um, and so if we track that onto our results, we can actually see that a metabolic index of about three was around um, 24 degrees Celsius. Um, and so this just, again, suggests that 24 is likely a maximum tolerable temperature. So altogether, to sum up um, the sort of direct effects of ocean warming on black sea bass, we find that 24 is likely a maximum tolerable temperature. Um, we see no acclimation to 30 degrees Celsius, and this does support um, potential warming effects leading to distribution shifts as the southern portion of that distribution can warm to 24 degrees Celsius in the summer and fall months, um, and will continue to do so into the future. And so moving on, we're now going to sort of work up to that population level and look more at these interspecific differences in black sea bass throughout their distribution. And you'll note now that this is a two-parter question. Um, and so first, I kind of want to walk through some of the reasons why we may expect to see differing population dynamics throughout their distribution. The first is that black sea bass exhibit site fidelity. So this means that fish that um, spawn in a certain location um, in their distribution will likely return to that same location year after year. And so we see in the northern portion of the distribution, a majority of those fish are spawning there year after year. Same can be said for the central and the southern portion. There's also differing um, migration distances because of where fish are spawning versus where fish are overwintering. So these northern fish tend to have a longer migration distance than say the southern fish with a minimal to no migration. And it's important to note that this migration happens right before spawning. So this could lead to some differences in energetics prior to spawning. Also throughout this distribution, there can be differences in the habitat type. So this map is looking at substrate. So there's differences, differences in the substrate. Um, there's also going to be differences in the types and amount of nat natural and artificial reefs, as well as food types. Now, black sea bass are generalist predators, so they're unlikely to be food limited, but food quality could differ throughout this distribution. And finally, um, specifically in state-managed inshore waters, black sea bass may experience differing fishing pressure. So each of the states throughout the distribution is provided a regional um, quota, and that is based off of regional biomass. And then from that, 
they can set their own minimum size limits, possession limits, and open seasons. And so depending on where a fish is say, spawning in the summer, they may be experiencing differing fishing pressure. So to get at this large broad scale question, we had to collect black sea bass throughout their distribution. Um, we collected them in Virginia, Delaware, New Jersey, and Massachusetts um, by through, through both hook and line and trap surveys. You'll note that we collected black sea bass across two different years. This is just a logistical um, part of the project. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about those implications later. Next, we brought black sea bass back to the lab and we dissected them for muscle and liver tissue. Um, these tissues can give us an indication of somatic energy storage um, and especially the liver that can be linked towards spawning. Essentially, the liver is a storage site for vitellogenin, a lipoprotein that is recruited to the ovary for reproduction. And so there's a direct link there. Um, and then we dissected out gonad to look at reproductive energetics, output, and maturity stage. So the first question that we asked is, how does spawning phenology or the timing of spawning and reproductive output differ latitudinally across this distribution? Um, this paper, um, you can find it in IC's Journal of Marine Science, and I also want to thank um, and acknowledge my co-authors here. So the additional measurements for this question um, included um, looking further at those gonads to identify maturity stages. Um, and then for the female fish, we also used ovarian histology, where we take a cross section of the ovary and stain it so we can look at the different types of oocytes underneath the slide. And so from here, um, we identified fish as either developing, spawning capable, that includes both ripe and ripe and running fishes, spent and resting. We also measured a gonadosomatic index, or the proportion of gonad weight to body weight of the spawning capable fishes, and we used this as a reproductive output proxy. Um, we didn't have the right sampling plan or manpower to estimate batch or total fecundity. And then afterwards, we analyzed spawning phenology and that gonadosomatic index um, with reference to timing and um, latitude. So first we're gonna walk through the um, spawning phenology results, starting with that's um, the beginning of spawning. Um, and the way to kind of read these heat maps is what we're looking for is this transition of a fish being spawning, uh, not spawning capable to a fish becoming spawning capable. So in these heat maps going from black to light yellow. For the start of spawning, latitude and Julian day interaction and a latitude and temperature interaction were in the best fit model. And essentially, we see that black sea bass begin spawning earlier in that southern portion of the distribution and later in the northern. And then with temperature, we actually see this wonky relationship where black sea bass start spawning in cooler temperatures in the south and warmer in the north. And this is likely an artifact of sampling location. Essentially, we were really only able to collect black sea bass um, further offshore in those southern locations. And so effectively, they were in deeper and colder water. Next, looking at the end of spawning, um, here we're looking at this transition of a fish being spawning capable to transitioning into a post-spawning stage. Um, temperature and a latitude by Julian Day interaction were in the best fit model. We see that fish begin to enter this post-spawning um, stage as temperature warms. And this makes sense because on the Northeast shelf in the fall, we tend to get really big storms that blow through the system. And that effectively mixes that really warm surface layer into the bottom um, layer of the ocean. Um, and there are some recent papers showing that it's these fall storms that might be a cue for black sea bass to kind of pack up shop and head out um, for the winter. Um, in terms of timing, we see that black sea bass end spawning earlier than in the north than in the south. And so this effectively gives those northern fish a shorter spawning season. And this makes sense because higher latitudes will have shorter summers. And so typically we'll see a shorter spawning season to kind of get everything done uh, before that um, winter hits. Moving on to reproductive output, again, we're using gonadosomatic index as our proxy. Um, we can see that reproductive output increases as we go further south, so going from Massachusetts to Virginia. Now, this result was actually pretty confusing to us because typically um, in these systems where fish spawn across multiple latitudes and we see that shorter spawning season in those northern latitudes, 
Fish will typically have higher reproductive output to compensate for that shorter spawning season, but we see the opposite. So this essentially means that these fish in Massachusetts had a shorter spawning season and lower reproductive output, um, which can, might be pretty concerning for that um, location. So altogether, um, and again, in this framework of that shifting biomass, in the region where we have been seeing increasing biomass in your Massachusetts, spawning duration was shorter and reproductive output was lower. Um, and so this may mean that this area could see limited recruitment into the future um, and was also kind of confusing to us. And so this led us into the next question of looking at the interspecific differences in black sea bass um, energy allocation throughout the distribution, trying to see if we can kind of get at maybe some of the mechanisms behind that lower reproductive output. Um, this paper was just accepted um, in Journal of Fish Biology. Um, you can read it, but it is not formatted. <laughs> um, and I also wanna thank and address all of my co-authors for this one as well. So the additional measurements um, for this study um, was to extract lipids from the muscle, liver, and gonad tissues, and then estimate an energy density and a total energy. And so I'm gonna walk through the final measurements that we're looking at. Um, the first is a lipid concentration. This is a gram of lipid to gram of dry weight. So essentially imagine you have a chunk of tissue and you remove all of the water from it. Now you're trying to see how much of that dried tissue is lipid. The next one we look at is the energy density. This is in kilojoules per gram of wet weight. So again, a chunk of tissue, but now without doing anything to the tissue, just trying to see how much energy is in it. Um, energy density combines both the contribution of lipid and protein energy. And then finally, for the liver and the gonad, where we have the full weight of that organ, we can multiply that by the energy density and get a total energy. And then ultimately, without going too far into our analysis, um, what we ended up doing is try to analyze whether or not region mattered. And if region mattered, that would indicate that we are seeing interspecific differences in black sea bass. So I'm gonna walk through each of our tissue types. Um, we're first gonna go through the spawning season and then through the regional effects. For muscle, we have the female and the male fish combined because their results were very similar. So first going through that spawning season, and again, we're sort of marching through these maturity stages. So going from developing, spawning capable, spent to resting. We see for both of our metrics, lipid concentration and energy density, a decrease throughout spawning, um, and then in muscle energy density, some post-spawning recovery. Um, this is actually pretty interesting because not all fish may dip into muscle energy um, during that spawning season. Across region, we found there was no effect for lipid concentration, but we do see one for energy density, whereby we saw higher values in the southern locations, so Virginia and Delaware, and lower near New Jersey and Massachusetts. Now, the fact that there was a regional effect for energy density, but not one for lipid concentration, suggests that a lot of these muscle energy dynamics are going to be driven by protein, which also kind of makes sense. Moving on to the liver. Now um, for the liver and gonad, um, we also have a total energy um, category and we are now looking at sex specific models because the sexes are quite different um, in these energy um, sites throughout spawning. So for the female fish across all of our metrics, we see this decrease throughout spawning and some post spawning recovery seen by that increase in those resting fish. And that's likely these fish um, preparing for that offshore migration. For the male fish, we see no change um, in their lipid concentration or energy density throughout the spawning season, but we do see a decrease um, throughout the spawning season in total energy. And this suggests to us that the male energetics are likely driven by just the size of the organ and not so much by the composition. So they're not necessarily packing in more energy, they're just increasing the size of the liver. Next, looking across region, for the female fish, um, region was always important, and we saw this general um, trend for all metrics of a decrease going from south to north. For the male fish, we see a regional effect for lipid concentration, but that's mostly driven by these Virginia males having a higher value than the other regions did. 
But then for the total energy, again, we see this similar trend of decreasing energetics going from south to north, um, similar to what we saw for the female fish. Next, moving on to gonad. Um, so for the female fish, again, we see this general trend of decreasing throughout the spawning season, but we see some nuanced differences between developing and spawning capable fishes, and this is likely a um, compositional effect. Um, so essentially, between the developing and spawning capable fish, we see no change in lipid concentration, so they're not adding any more lipids to their gonad. Um, and so what we are seeing for energy density and total energy is essentially the effect of hydrated oocytes, um, which is our marker for spawning capable. So these hydrated oocytes, which are the last step before um, an oocyte becomes an egg, it have a high water content and they're also super heavy. And so that high water content is going to increase the denominator for that energy density metric. Um, and it's going to also increase the weight of the gonad and so increase that total energy. And so that's kind of why we see these opposing metrics. For the male fish, we see no change in lipid concentration throughout um, spawning. We see this increase in the energy density. This is also a effect of composition. Essentially, as the testes enter post-spawning stages, their water content decreases substantially and that decreases the denominator, artificially increasing our metric. And then across total energy, we see a similar trend as in the female fish. But again, you can see this pretty um, disparate difference between male and female fish in terms of energy usage throughout spawning. Next, looking across region, we find for the female fish that, again, region is always important. Um, and there is a less clear but um, semi there relationship of decreasing energetics going from south to north. We essentially see no regional effect for the male fish. And while there is one for lipid concentration, this is likely due to those Virginia males having that lower um, lipid concentration than the rest of the regions. And so ultimately what this means is that male fish throughout the spawning season are more similar to each other than female fish are. All right, so to kind of walk through all of those results, Again, um, looking at our somatic energy storage sites, we find that both of them decrease throughout spawning. So this indicates some consumption of energy stores um, throughout that spawning season. We see female and male liver energetics differ throughout their distribution. So there are intraspecific differences. And we generally see decreasing energetics going from south to north. So this means that those southern fish were in better energetic status throughout the spawning season than those fish in the north. Next, if we look at the gonad, we see that these reproductive energy stores decrease throughout spawning for female and male fish, but we can see that pretty big difference between the contribution from female fish than from male fish. And that is likely why we end up seeing no regional differences for the male fish, but we do see them for the female fish. Essentially, female fish are more sensitive because of that high energy demand. And so little differences throughout the distribution may actually act upon their reproduction. And then finally, we suggest that the lower um, reproductive energetics in these northern location is likely driven by that lower somatic energy storage. Um, and we have a couple of hypotheses as to what's going on. Um, and I'm happy to also go over some of those later. All right, so to kind of sum up that final part of this question, we see again in that reference of increasing biomass region. So near Massachusetts, there are lower energy stores um, and that likely led to lower reproductive energy. And we suggest that this is a reason for that lower reproductive output that we saw. So altogether, what does this mean for black sea bass? Again, looking first at that individual level, we see that black sea bass are negatively affected by warming at temperatures that we find near the most southern portion of the distribution. And the importance of this is that we are seeing and may continue to see loss in suitable thermal habitat in that southern portion of the distribution. And this may be one of the drivers of that distribution shift we have been seeing. At the population level, we see that black sea bass exhibit intraspecific differences in reproduction and energetics. And we generally saw lower values um, in these northern locations. And the importance of this is that 
These differences could lead to uneven recruitment success throughout the distribution, and this has implications for fisheries management. Again, across that distribution, we see um, regional quota that is based off of regional biomass. Um, and so as we see an increase in biomass, it's you know, natural to be asked, well, can we increase quota up in the north? Um, but we kind of lead a cautionary tale that maybe that's not the best idea if the recruitment um, is suffering compared to other locations. And actually to kind of bring all that home, um, this, I forgot to get the most recent one, but the recent one continues to tell the same story, but essentially looking at the black sea bass um, stock assessment. And so what we're looking at is trends in black sea bass, um, spawning stock biomass. So how many um, adult fish that can spawn are in the system. And then recruitment seen here in yellow. Um, so this is recruitment, which is the number of new fish added to the system. And so essentially what we've seen over time is that there was a really big pulse of fish. Um, this is the 2011 cohort. Um, and you can see that subsequent increase in that spawning stock biomass. And a majority of these fish were actually from north of the Hudson Canyon, so north of New Jersey. And we think that black sea bass, in addition to site fidelity, may have some natal homing. And so that may be one of the reasons we saw this spike in fish in the north. Um, and then the only other year that we've seen a good recruitment year was actually around 2015. But this actually seemed to come more from that central and southern portion of the distribution. And then since then, we've seen continuously poor rec recruitment years. Um, so there's kind of this concern about um, how to manage these guys as we see these big pulses of fish. Um, but that last big pulse is about to age out soon. Um, and so this is kind of continuing work, um, but I think kind of holds in the um, importance of looking at differences across the distribution. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed um, our trip to the U.S. Northeast Shelf. Um, we're now going to move over to the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska, um, where I'm going to briefly go over some of my postdoctoral work that I'll be doing out here. So the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska are these, um, we're primarily looking at these two um, large ecosystems surrounding Alaska. Um, and these high latitude systems have been simultaneously experiencing warming. Um, and this is primarily through the intensity and frequency of marine heat waves, um, as well as ocean acidification um, that we tend to see um, amplified effects in these really cold water systems. Um, these Alaskan waters are very productive commercial, have very productive commercial and recreational fisheries and in fact produce about half of the fish caught in the US. So this is also a very important region um, and the current effects of climate change are pretty concerning. So for my postdoctoral research, I'm gonna be focusing on three main fish species. The first is Pacific cod. So this gadid is one of the second largest, is the second largest commercial ground fish catch in the US. So it's a very important commercial species. Um, and in terms of climate change, um, studies have shown that they are sensitive to warming at the egg stage, um, but they, they saw faster growth at the larval stage and negative impacts from ocean acidification diminished after about five weeks. So it's kind of a mixed bag um, and we haven't really looked at the combined stressors for Pacific cod. Next fish we'll be looking at is yellowfin sole. Um, so this is the highest landed flatfish in the world. Um, so it's also a very important commercial species. I also want to point out that it has pretty late maturity, and we essentially don't know any of the temperature or pH effects on them. Um, there have been similar flatfish um, studies done, but none have been done yet for yellowfin sole. And then finally, we'll be also looking at Arctic cod, which are another gadid. Um, these guys are um, fast growing and short lived, but they serve as a really important um, ecosystem link in the Arctic food web. Um, and so while there isn't a current fishery for them, um, they do support, um, they're a main prey source for many other um, fish species that are sought after. And in terms of climate change effects, um, we've seen that they're negatively impacted by temperature um, and also um, negatively impacted by the combined stressors of ocean warming and ocean acidification at that egg stage. And so altogether, the big broad research question for these three fish species is does the com combination of ocean warming and acidification increase negative effects of climate change? And so in order to tackle this question for each of our fish, we're gonna be running incubation experiments 
we're running a fully factorial um, setup where we'll be looking at three different temperature treatments going from warm to or cold to hot, and then two different pH treatments, um, ambient pH and a low pH. And then we also have the ability to run all of these in replicates of four. For all of these um, incubations, we'll be starting at the embryo stage, and then we'll be carrying out through hatch and then continuing into the larval stage um, a certain number of post days hatch. And the metrics that we'll be looking at are hatch success, size at hatch, survival and growth. And then the new thing that I'm gonna be also looking at is metabolic enzymes to try to use a um, more sensitive physiological measurement to try to understand some of the um, effects that are occurring at these different treatments. And so I'm gonna briefly go over these metabolic enzymes that we'll be looking at. And in order to do that, I first need to refresh glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain, then three main steps in energy production. And the only thing that I need anyone to remember is that glycolysis takes us from glucose or sugar um, into citrate, which is what we're entering the citric acid cycle, which then through that and further down, we go through the electron transport chain. And it's this portion that generates the most ATP. But glycolysis also generates ATP, and that ATP production is much faster than the ATP production down here. Um, and so all the enzymes we're looking at are related to just this portion of glycolysis. So the first enzyme that we'll be looking at is citrate synthase, and this enzyme catalyzes the reaction of acetyl-CoA into citrate and entering the citric acid cycle. And so we tend to look at citrate synthase as a measure of aerobic metabolic capacity. Um, and so um, like a human with a really high aerobic metabolic capacity might be a marathon runner compared to say a sprinter. The next enzyme we'll be looking at is called lactate dehydrogenase. And this catalyzes the reaction from pyruvate into lactate. And it um, is our indicator of increased anaerobic metabolism. And anaerobic metabolism can be ramped up under a couple of reasons. One of them can be just an increase in activity where we need that really fast ATP production. Another can be a mismatch in oxygen supply and demand where at the um, other portion of energy production where we need oxygen, there's not enough. Um, and so we'll have a, a speeding up of glycolysis as well. And then finally, we'll be looking at the 3 hydroxyacyl coa dehydrogenase, or HODE for short. And essentially, this enzyme is the last, is the enzyme that catalyzes the last reaction in beta oxidation or um, ketogenesis. Um, so essentially taking a fatty acid instead of glucose as that energy source um, and entering into the into glycolysis through acetyl CoA. And so this can give us an indication of um, a differing energy source usage as well as additional look at the aerobic capacity um, of that fish. And all of that is in the works. We're starting up experiments um, pretty much now. Um, and I will also point out that I've never done metabolic enzyme assays. And so if anyone wants to chat or has done them and I could pick their brain, that would also, also be awesome. And with that, um, I just have many acknowledgments. Um, so I first have to give a huge thanks to um, everyone that helped out with research support um, during my PhD. This includes um, methodology, statistics, or providing lab space when I was traveling throughout the East Coast. A big thanks to everyone that helped out with fish collection. Um, this includes recreational fishing captains that put me on fish, um, as well as um, employees through state departments that were part of the trap surveys out there. A big thanks to my funding sources, both during my PhD and now. And um, finally, just a huge thanks to all the undergraduate mentees I had at Rutgers. Um, they, they were the reason I was able to get so much done, um, and it was a pleasure working with them. And with that, I'll take questions. Thanks, Emily. I appreciate that. Um, since you put out a call for potential collaborators, do you have a place um, or do you want to put in chat your contact information yes. so folks can reach out to you? Um, 
And then for everybody online, feel free to put any questions into the chat and we can work through those if you have them. Um, you can also see that Emily just put in her NOAA contacts. So if you'd like to reach out to her directly, you can do that. Uh, while folks are forming their questions, I had a couple for you. Um, going back to your black sea bass, you talked about a range shift in biomass. I was wondering if there's been any range shift in those um, uh, reproductive sites at all that's been noted? Um, like there's more fish reproducing further north sort of thing. Yeah, you, you said that they had some um, site fidelity and so they would yes. go back to the same site. And so I was wondering if we're seeing a shift in that site fidelity at all slightly north. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and um, part of that is because the range shift that we look at, um, we typically look at two different um, surveys, one in the spring and one in the fall. And the fall one really gets at when they are inshore. Um, and that's when they're spawning. So that's kind of like our view of where they were during that spawning season. Um, but yeah, the, the idea that the cycle can perpetuate um, because you have more fish spawning north and those fish may return north um, is actually, um, her name is Elise Koo, but she looked at otolith microchemistry to try to use that as um, a way to look at natal homing. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's something that I think that we, think is happening, but we don't have a great grasp on yet. Yeah. Thank you for trying to address my question. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, Greg, I see you have your hand up. You should be able to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question verbally. Thanks, uh, Cinnamon. Great presentation, Emily. Really, really fantastic work. I was kind of curious especially uh, about the, uh, uh, the Black Sea Bass work and kind of, to, I guess, to some degree, a bit of a follow-up to what Cinnamon was asking, really about stock structure. Um, you know, you mentioned something about regional allocations, and I'm assuming that the assessment is for the entire uh, population as being one stock. Um, is that correct? Because I know that what's going on right now at, at this particular council meeting that's happening in uh, March, um, they're looking at stock structure in part or in, in terms of management sort of aspects, in part because of, you know, some of the results from the recent uh, uh, most recent round of stock assessments and, and uh, um, that so i'll leave it at that if that is clear enough yeah um and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up um one of the things i didn't have time to put in but um in 2018 there was a black sea bass working group and they basically tried to see if they ran the stock assessment um as one full stock which they usually do um, versus running it as um, two separate management groups, north and south of the Hudson Canyon, because um, there are a lot of differences, both in terms of physics and biology um, at that location. And it ended up being that the um, two sub stock, stock assessment um, performed much better than the entire stock one. Um, and so I think in the future ones, that's something that they've been um, trying to incorporate. Um, and that was kind of one of the um, inspirations for also looking at, at this, um, for Black Sea Bass. I hope that kind of gets that. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great answer. I appreciate you uh, hearing that. It's good. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Otherwise, you get to listen to my questions again. Um, so I wanted to jump to your current work. And forgive me for not knowing, but for the cod and the uh, flatfish that you're going to be looking at, are we seeing range shifts or changes that you know of that might indicate that we're seeing some stressors? I, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're just starting the work. So I, I kind of knew I'd be pushing, but I thought I would ask. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, it's some, something that I, I kind of need to dig in more, but my inkling is that it might be less clear um, if that, if a rain shift is happening. Um, I think it's, what's also hard is, um, and I've kind of been going back and forth too, is kind of thinking about um, kind of similar in parallel to black sea bass, um, 
where my work was on one stock of black sea bass, but there's two other stocks. Um, and so the similar idea here, right, that there are two different stocks that technically we could be looking at either in the Bering Sea or Gulf of Alaska. Um, and so there could also be like different dynamics between those two locations, um, but it's good research for me to do. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and we have a question. Um, do you see the chat, Emily, or should I? I'll read them out anyway for folks that can't see okay. them. But um, there was a very large decrease in PCOD recruitment a couple of years ago that has been tied to the ocean temperature, either um, the egg or larval state. Oh, so it kind of an answer uh, Lynn is giving us. Yeah, and I, and I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if they've been responding with range shifts as much as not. I think um, what's tricky too is a lot of the, um, Northeast shelf work too. There's been a lot of stuff showing that some of these changes in population can also be driven by fishing pr pressure and management decisions. Um, and so, because the East Coast has this big history of um, overfishing um, in the 1970s. Um, and so, there's, there's kind of this also wonky trying to disentangle climate change versus fishing. Okay. And yeah, thinking a little bit about what Lynn's saying here that maybe not range shift, but just change in recruitment, mm -hmm. kind of like that other piece of the black cod uh, or the black yeah. uh, sea bass that you were talking yeah. about might be more of the thing that we're seeing at this time um, in those species in Alaska. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any other questions, but I'm going to just spitball here for a second so that <laughs> folks can put them in if they want. Um, and Emily, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us or any other um uh, thoughts that you might have about your project or questions you might have for the group. You have some really uh, good folks online with you at the moment. Um, so if you have anything, you can throw it out there. Yeah, I guess um, I one thing that I didn't know if I would have time to show. Um, sorry, these are all my now. These are all my backup slides. Um, <laughs> That's okay. We can be messy now. Oh, here we go. Um, okay, but I kind of so I think. Um, because there's kind of like a, a couple questions about differences across distribution and um, in terms of um, recruitment in these different locations and what's going on. Um, I just kind of wanted to share some of our hypotheses, but we don't know if these are you know real or not, of why those fish up near Massachusetts did so poorly. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, kind of what I was getting at before is you know this idea of maybe this pre-spawning migration leads to differences in energetic um, sort of status right before the um, spawning season. Uh, some fish that have differing migration distances, maybe packing a ton of energy before they migrate or they get there and they eat and eat and eat and then start spawning. But we saw these fish in pretty low status. Um, importantly though, if the winters keep warming up, black sea bass may you know, start to overwinter here and that may actually reduce some of that distance. So that's also an open question. Um, we saw this huge boom of black sea bass up here. And so there could also be density dependence effects occurring. So other fish have shown that if they have really high de um, densities, um, their um, reproduction is actually a bit lower than in areas with lower density. Um, also in that vein of migration distance, um, if you are bigger, you are a more efficient swimmer. And so um, there could be that these fish also allocate energy towards growth and not just towards reproduction. Um, to, Cause, and we do see that these fish up north are, tend to be bigger um, than down south. Um, and then we could also have sampled a bad year. Um, and that's the problem of doing these studies where you just get one, one snapshot in time. But regardless, a bad year matters. Um, you know, if that is something that we picked up um, in terms, and we see that reflected in the recruitment, so. In case anyone was just shy to ask me why these are <laughs> these are our reasons. <laughs> yeah, I think you just point to the fact that um, as we start looking at uh, climate change, it's just uh, a factor upon factor upon factor that's hard to tease apart. What is that dominant thing that's making these yeah. changes? And really, it's often many things that are all uh, adding to the uh, impact on the fishes that we see. Definitely. Okay. Um, 
Emily, thank you so much for being here. For everybody that's still hanging in with us online, we appreciate you being here. I hope you join us next week when we get to talk a little bit more about um, equity and inclusion in our field. So I would encourage you to come on back. Um, but for Emily, thank you so very, very much. You are getting, I don't know if you can see them, all the Zoom uh, congratulations, thank yous and claps. Um, so that's coming in. So uh, thank you so much for sharing with us. We appreciate it for everybody. Uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. And Emily, thanks again. Thank you. All right, everybody. Until next time. Bye now.